So thank you for the introduction, Joachim, and um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I am going to be focusing um, our discussions on the role of hematopoietic stem cell transplant for severe plastic anemia. And so um, just briefly, I'll outline, you know, what is aplastic anemia? I'm sure many of um, the people in this panel now know, but we, I'll just go over it for those of you who haven't heard of this disease before. And I'm going to briefly touch on um, some of the causes of aplastic anemia and bone marrow failure syndromes. I know some of our other um, talks today are also going to touch on this. And then mostly I'm going to be focusing my discussion of the talk today on the treatment options um, and, and some of the advances that we've seen in aplastic anemia therapy over the last few years. So this is a rather busy slide, I apologize, but just to kind of start off with some of the basics, um, you know, we the, the bone marrow is, is an important factory that houses your hematopoietic stem cells, as you can see. And, and these stem cells are responsible for producing really important cells that your body needs, such as red cells, platelets, and white cells. And when we talk about the white cells in particular, um, especially in, in marrow failure syndromes, we really focus a lot on um, the neutrophils as well as the, the white cells, the T cells and B cells um, that are a part of, an important part of your immune system. So essentially in patients who develop bone marrow failure syndromes, the stem cells either don't function properly or they, there's a decreased amount of them resulting in a decrease in the amount of red cells, platelets and white cells. And so we usually think about this process in two ways. One is whether it was acquired or two, if it was inherited. And I know Dr. Um, Keel just kind of talked a little bit about this, but there are some <laughs> genetic disorders. Um, the, uh, a few of them are listed here on the side, which can also present in a very similar manner um, to aplastic anemia. So it is important in some of our patients, um, particularly as I am a pediatrician, um, particularly in pediatric patients because um, the, they tend to present more often in younger adults, but it doesn't mean that we can't see them in some of our adults as they age as well. And then when we talk about acquired aplastic anemia, we really kind of characterize the, the most common one that we think about is really idiopathic, so that we don't un, really have a reasoning for why this aplasia of the bone marrow happened. Um, there are some autoimmune disorders, for example, like rheumatoid arthritis or um, lupus that have been associated with decreased marrow stem, um, stem cell productions, as well as um, PNH and myelodysplastic syndromes, which will be discussed a little bit more detail in other talks. And then of course, some infections such as um, HIV, for example, um, some of our medications like insecticides and chemotherapy agents, for example, these can all lead to a decreased production in your stem cells. But today I'm gonna be focusing really on the, the role of the idiopathic aplastic anemia, in which we don't have an identified cause. So aplastic anemia um, is a rare life-threatening um, form of a bone marrow failure syndrome. The incidence um, is about two cases in a million um, people per year. So it is quite rare, but in those patients that it does develop, it is, is quite, it could be life-threatening. And as I mentioned, it's a failed production of erythrocytes, which are your red cells, your white cells and platelets. And that's because there's a deficiency in the hematopoietic stem cells. And oftentimes this deficiency results in the bone marrow being hypocellular or not as full as we would expect it to be. As I mentioned, most um, patients have no identified underlying cause, and so we classify that as idiopathic, though we still do anticipate that probably a component of this is autoimmune destruction of, of the stem cells. It just is oftentimes hard to truly diagnose this autoimmunity. Um, aplastic anemia can occur in all age groups and it affects both genders equally. We do see that, the, that approximately half of the cases of aplastic anemia occur within the first three decades of life. So, um, so again, uh, part, that may also be related to underlying genetic disorders. And then I do, uh, you know, I'll touch on this a little bit later throughout the talk, but we do know that the severe plastic anemia patients, a subset of them, 
can um, go on to develop abnormal chromosomes um, and even myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia. And we see this um, incidence occurring in about approximately 15% of patients who are diagnosed with aplastic anemia. So this is just a very basic slide um, kind of showing you what our bone marrow biopsy results look like. As you can see on the left, we have a normal bone marrow, which is quite full in a lot of these cells that are located in um, those pink cells located within the bone marrow are the red blood cell and platelets and, um, and white cell producing cells. And then when you look at patients with aplastic anemia or bone marrow failure syndromes, you can see that it's quite empty and it's mostly just full of um, fat. Um, so we do see very little production of um, our blood forming cells. So I did uh, just wanna to touch a little bit on testing for genetic causes. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, there are a subset of patients who who may have not been diagnosed with a genetic disease early in life, but present um, with their first finding being a bone marrow failure syndrome. And it's important, and we, we do see this, I think, um, in, in adult patients, though it is more common in pediatric, um, in the pediatric cohort. And that's because um, our therapies really depend on the diagnosis. So we, when we talk about a um, therapy for aplastic anemia. We, we talk about immunosuppressive therapy as well as bone marrow transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And in some of these patients with known genetic causes of their marrow failure, they will have a poor or even very limited response to immunosuppressive therapy. So it's important to kind of identify these patients so that we don't put them through a therapy that we don't think will be effective. Additionally, um, the patients with marrow, uh, bone marrow failure syndromes, um, genetic ones, um, are at a higher risk of developing MDS and leukemia. So I mentioned that aplastic anemia patients typically have a 15% um, risk, um, but it is higher in those with a genetic, an underlying genetic cause. Um, there are some dis disorders, such as, for example, Fanconi anemia, dyskeratosis congenita, where there's standard um, transplant regimen, chemotherapy regimens that we use for severe plastic anemia may be too toxic for them. And so this is important for us when deciding if a patient needs to proceed forward with transplant because it will impact the chemotherapy drugs we give them and we would opt for a lower intensity regimen. Additionally, it would inform us um, of our donor choice. So if there is a familial syndrome in the family and we're looking at you know, a matched sibling donor, it would be really important to also rule out that that, that donor doesn't have the underlying genetic cause um, because we, we would not want to transplant those abnormal cells into um, our patients. Again, not really fixing the, the underlying problem. So just to kind of highlight, um, when we talk about severe aplastic anemia, the, when we talk about aplastic anemia, we really do have a, a disease severity um, criteria, and that determines which patients will go on to receive therapy. And our typical um, criteria for severe plastic anemia has really been defined as those patients who have a bone marrow cellularity that is less than 25%. And so, um, you know, when, when we talk about, for example, pediatric patients, um, their bone marrow cellularity is usually on average around 80, um, 80 percent full. The, the other 20 percent is fat. Um, and as you age, the cellularity does go down. But we, we talk about the, so 25% cellularity is quite low. It's mostly full of fat. And this we see in adult patients as well. Sometimes you can have patients where they're, they're making their cells, the bone marrow is full. It's still 50% cellularity, but we don't see any of the hematopoietic cells that they're not growing there. And then additionally, we need you to have um, two of three of the following criteria. And this is based on preferred blood. So when we do a blood draw and check your CBC, we're looking at your neutrophils, your your plate being less than 500, um, your platelets being less than 20, and then your retic count also being less than 20. And then more recently, you know, we've also defined patients with very severe uh, aplastic anemia, those having a neutrophil count less than 200. And so these are the patients that we would then move forward with upfront therapy. 
So treatment options for aplastic anemia include hematopoietic stem cell transplant or immunosuppressive therapy. And the determination of who will go to which therapy is really dependent on what we anticipate the survival of that therapy will be. It is also impacted by the patient's age. And so I will show you some um, information about that. And then what are your donor options? Do you have someone um, such as a sibling who is HLA matched and we can utilize them as a donor? Or do we need to look for donors outside of the family um, as, as an option. Additionally, we do want to take into consideration the patient's comorbidities. Um, you know, you could be young and have great donor options, but if, if you're quite sick when you present, then transplant, for example, may not be the right, the right um, option for you. And then we do also want to consider the short and long-term complications um, for both adults and pediatric patients. So I know this is a busy slide and I, I apologize um, for that, but I thought it was nice, um, a nice little algorithm outlining how we look at patients and um, what options for therapy we have based on age. And so as you can see here, oh, sorry. Um, when we talk about patients who are um, well, children less than 18 years of age, or adults less than 40 years of age, the first line therapy that we recommend if you have a matched sibling is to proceed forward with bone marrow transplant. Um, and I will show you uh, the reasoning for that in the next few slides. So matched sibling um, transplants are generally, as I mentioned, considered first line therapy for children and adults less than 40 years of age. We see that the overall survival, so that's how many patients will survive the transplant, as well as the event-free survival, which refers to how many patients will survive the transplant and be cured um, without recurrence of the aplastic anemia, ranges anywhere from 80 to, to 95%, which is um, a very good outcome for a curative result. Additionally, we, we've over the years learned ways to utilize non-radiation-based chemotherapy regimens. And this is important, especially in children, because it allows us to consider some of those long-term side effects that we worry about. Um, and, and we can maintain growth and development and even fertility in some of our, our pediatric young adult patients. Um, additionally, when we think about transplant, we want to consider the risks. Um, and so inherently with matched sibling transplants, um, the risks that we worry about such as graft failure, and that's when you know, we, we give the donor stem cells but they don't um, grow, is very low. We also do worry about graft versus host disease. Um, so that's when you take the donor stem cells um, and the donor T cells will start attacking the host or the patient's body. And when you're fully matched um, with a sibling, the likelihood of developing graft versus host disease is quite low. And, and as well, um, the younger you are, plus a combination of the chemotherapy drugs we use, um, the organ toxicities, um, short-term and long-term are very low with, with our matched sibling transplants. And so I will point out that even though, um, you know, we have an age limit of 40 written for adults, um, over the, you know, last several years, uh, it's becoming, th these are just kind of guidelines. We do have very young, healthy adults, um, you know, even in their 50s and 60s, where if they have a matched sibling um, and they don't have a lot of comorbidities, it is an option to consider doing a transplant upfront. Uh, but the initial data that we had was really based on a compilation of patients transplanted in Europe. And what you can see in this um, survival curve is that those patients who were over 40 years of age were found to have lower survival if they went to transplant first. Um, whereas the younger patients, oops, sorry. I apologize for that, it went dark in here. <laughs> um, the younger patients uh, will have better outcomes. And so that's where the decision-making process really came from. I do wanna just highlight that um, there are some centers and um, that have really great results. And so our um, locally here at Seattle Children's and Fred Hutch, we had a study looking at pediatric patients who underwent a matched sibling donor transplant. Um, and uh, they received chemotherapy um, conditioning with cyclophosphamide and ATG. 
um, and, the, and the survival was 100%. And so we do really think that for young, healthy adults, transplant is the, matched sibling transplant is the best curative option up front. So what if you don't have a matched sibling donor or if you're um, older than 40, for example? Um, the next, the, in that case, the frontline therapy really is immunosuppressive therapy. And I'm gonna talk about the, our previous immunosuppressive therapy as well as some new agents that we have now added into the mix. So immunosuppressive therapy really consists of um, horse antithymolate globulin or ATG. And so this is a collection of antibodies um, towards T cells that are collected from a horse. And um, with that in combination with an immunosuppressive drug called cyclosporin, this is the uh, therapy that is administered to, um, I, as I mentioned, patients who don't have a matched sibling or who are older than 40 years of age. It is an effective treatment and it has a response rate about 60 to 70%. Um, I do want to point out that though, when we talk about response rate, um, we're not talking about complete uh, cure or correction of the abnormal platelets, um, neutrophils or, or white cell numbers. Oftentimes the blood counts still remain abnormal, but you're out of that risk of, um, out of the window of risk. So for example, your neutrophil count may be um, still within an abnormal range, but it's above 500. So your infection risk is significantly lower. Similarly, your platelets may not be back into normal, but you're out of that bleeding risk range. And so this is when we talk about, um, it is a response. There is a response rate of 70%, but you, it doesn't always mean that you'll have normal blood counts. It does also take um, a approximately two to four months to start seeing a response to this therapy. And then we do know that patients, about 30% of patients, um, even after therapy, and even if they do get some response, will have relapse or recurrence of their cytokinia as a low blood counts. Um, and then there is a, a risk for developing MDS um, or AML. And as I mentioned before, that's about 15%. And we really do think that this risk is related more to the underlying um, aplastic anemia um, and not so much related to the medications that we're giving because uh, there are other disorders in which we administer ATG and cyclosporin and we do not see evidence of clonal disorders or progression to pre-leukemia phases. Um, so that is a, something also to kind of consider. And, and this actually is a nice kind of comparison of looking at survival in, in pediatric and young adult patients. And it compared directly patients who received a, a matched sibling donor transplant, that's the line in red, compared to those who received upfront immunosuppressive therapy. And you can see that while um, the overall survival, which is this curve here, you know, people will be alive and survive the therapies. Um, but what we notice in this event-free survival curve is that approximately 55% of patients um, would have an event called like recurrence or relapse. And so while they would be alive, um, their disease had returned or they had progressed on to MDS and AML. And this um, event-free survival was significantly lower um, in patients who received um, upfront immunosuppressive therapy compared to a matched sibling donor transplant. So we also want to consider, you know, what if you have some response to, to therapy, but it's not complete or, um, you know, if you have recurrence. And so typically we want to make sure that the IST therapy is given at least three to six months to see if we've had response. If in the younger adults there are no, um, no evidence of response, then we want to move forward with a matched unrelated donor um, option. And that's because they're, they're now, especially, we do have great outcomes with these donor choices. However, there is still limitations in finding a donor. So depending on your ethnicity, um, there may not be suitable donor options out there for you. And then in some of our older patients or those with you know, more com comorbidities, you may consider a second course of immunosuppressive therapy, or you may can um, with ATG and cyclosporin, or you can add on other newer drugs like Altrombapag. And um, in Europe, they particularly like an, the drug called um, Alentuzumab or Campath as another option to help treat the plastic anemia. So the, the 
Ultrombopag peg is a new drug that kind of came out a, a few years ago, and it's actually an oral medication that helps stimulate the stem cells. Um, and what we've seen is that in patients where you add Ultrombopeg with IST therapy, that the overall response rate is much higher at the six month mark. We see a response rate about 87% in comparison to the the historical response of around 66%. And again, just remember it's it most of the time it's a partial or not a not a complete response, but um, there are patients that have better counts after receiving Ultrombopeg. We still did see that about 30% of patients who received um, the addition of IST and Ultrombopeg still had relapse. And then the risk of MDS and AML is still about the same. It's still 10 to 15%. And so more recently, the Europeans have been looking at um, uh, a tre treatment of comparing, you know, Ultrambopeg um, in addition to IST therapy up front compared to those who just received IST therapy alone. And as you can see, um, it's a very busy slide, but I just want to point out that the overall response at three months um, was only 31% for immunosuppressive therapy alone. But when you add in Ultrombopag, it was close to 60%. So, you know, a good a larger number of patients would have good response to, with the addition of this medicine. And now it really is truly becoming used upfront in IST therapy um, for our patients. So in the patients who either, um, you know, tried immunosuppressive therapy and failed, the next options for um, treatment really are use of a unrelated donor. Um, and so I, wanted to briefly quickly show you these slides from um, the CIBMTR, which is our, uh, it's an international um, bone marrow transplant registry. And they looked at patient, the survival of patients who received a matched unrelated donor transplant for severe plastic anemia. Um, and you can see that historically, again, this is from 2008 to 2018, um, but the matched sibling donors do have a better overall survival than matched unrelated donors. And this is particularly seen in patients older than 18. But more recently, we've been able to, um, there's been several studies done where we look at um, different combinations of chemotherapy to see if we can improve the survival rates for patients receiving an unrelated donor transplant. And more recently, there was a, a study that Dr. Yogandig was part of, but um, really utilizing a chemotherapy uh, regimen that included flugerabine, two uh, gray of total body radiation, so this regimen does contain some radiation, as well as ATG, and then the addition of um, cyclophosphamide. And um, the study looked at trying to figure out the optimal dose of cyclophosphamide and found that in patients where we receive 50 milligrams per kilogram dosing, that the survival with an unrelated donor transplant was 97%. And these, these results are very encouraging. And so it's led to the question of, can we offer upfront matched unrelated donor transplant to patients um, who don't have a matched sibling and um, are healthy enough that we think that they could proceed forward um, without IST. So the pros is that it would option, provide a curative option, um, especially in the pediatric patients. And then there would be lower transplant toxicity in the younger patients. Of course, the cons really are related to what is the likelihood of finding an unrelated donor, and um, it is much lower in patients of ethnic minorities. And um, we also have to make sure that the donors are willing to donate. And then one of the cons, but not really, since this is improving over time, we don't have a lot of head-on-head -head comparisons um, of, the, of using upfront unrelated donor transplants compared to IST therapy. So as we do more studies, we'll learn, is it truly more beneficial than immunosuppressive therapy? And so this is one of the studies that was actually done, again, in pediatric patients where they did um, a combination. They looked at patients who received uh, chemotherapy, IST therapy, immunosuppressive therapy, or those who um, received a matched sibling donor transplant and those that who received matched unrelated donor transplants up front. And these um, figures here are really just showing you what the overall survival 
and the event-free survival was um, comparing matched siblings and matched unrelated donors. And you can see that they're comparable. So um, with this in the newer age, um, as well as this combination of chemotherapy conditioning that they used, they found that um, the likelihood of survival and that the disease doesn't return is the same with both matched sibling and matched unrelated donors. Um, so the only thing is that, you, you know, trying to work up the donor quickly and making sure that we proceed forward is an important part of it. Um, this study, the TransIT study, which is now closed, but um, was recently open and it was directly comparing patients um, under the age of 25 years of age with severe prostate anemia um, and comparing immunosuppressive therapy with um, cyclosporin and ATG to those patients who received a matched unrelated donor. Um, and I have some preliminary data. We had about 56 patients enrolled on that study. And so 12 of the patients went to transplant upfront and 11 patients were randomized um, to immunosuppressive therapy. And as you can see, the all patients survived, um, but we did have in the transplant group, but we did have one patient who unfortunately developed graft failure um, after the after they received their matched unrelated donor, and you get to go on to a second transplant. In comparison, in, in about only 55% of the patients who received immunosuppressive therapy had response. And, the, and then ultimately five of those six went on to receive a transplant afterwards. So I'm, we're looking forward to seeing what the overall results, um, survival and event-free survival data will be, but they're still analyzing that. Um, and so this again is just supporting what I just said previously is that really what's important is knowing whether or not the, the event-free survival is lower um, after you receive an unrelated donor transplant. And so this, uh, sorry, this um, uh, graph really highlights those patients who received immunosuppressive therapy first had failure and did not respond to IST therapy and then went on to receive a matched unrelated donor. And what it's showing is that in comparison to those patients who went directly to matched un unrelated donors, that the survival is lower. Um, and that might be related to the duration of neutropenia, of thrombocytopenia, low counts, adding comorbidities to these patients. So there may be um, changes to these algorithms where we now start doing upfront unrelated donor transplants um, in patients who have a matched unrelated donor. So for those patients who don't have any donor option, an unrelated donor or sibling donor options, we more recently uh, pay groups have been looking at the use of half-matched or haploidentical donors. And, um, and the reason for this is um, because most patients will have a readily available parent or sibling potentially that would be half of um, HOA matched to them. Um, in the past and historically, this was reserved for later on in our therapeutic algorithm. And that's because there are concerns for increased transplant related mortality and morbidity. And one of the um, major concerns we had in the past was the high rates of graft versus host disease. Um, and so with the more recent um, use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, so this means administering um, a chemotherapy drug called cyclophosphamide, after the stem cells go in, we've been able to get rid of the or deplete the donor T cells that are responsible for causing graft versus host disease. And this has actually led to really encouraging early results. Um, so particularly we have a group of um, you know patients here at 37, the median age is 25 years of age. And so we had a fair number of adults in this cohort. And you can see that um, the overall survival was 94% in these patients. And so um, we did still have some rates of graft versus host disease, but they were comparable to those uh, related that we see with matched sibling or matched unrelated donors. 
and um, the graph failure rate was a little bit higher than what we typically see in the matched siblings. Um, but I think overall um, that was related partly to the dose of radiation that was used. So um, in this um, chemotherapy regimen, the use of four gray TBI, it's still quite low, but um, it, that really helped to decrease the risk of graph rejection. And um, they did look at patients who received upfront, um, sorry, upfront transplant um, that had not received any treatment for immunosuppressive treatment, as well as those with relapsed um, refractory aplastic anemia, and the outcomes were very good. So I think, you know, when we talk about the new algorithm management and um, it's, it's a busy slide, but I think that what we want to kind of just highlight and what I wanted to highlight is in the patients less than 40 years of age, um, our first line choice is still a matched sibling donor, but if they're younger, um, you know, if they're under 20, and I would argue even under 30 years of age, we may want to consider doing an upfront unrelated donor transplant for them, especially if we can identify one quickly and move forward. Um, for those patients who are older than 40 years of age, the new therapy guidelines really should include immunosuppressive therapy with Alptrombopeg because we do see better response rates with that. And then if you have response after six months, you will continue just to taper down on those medications and follow. Um, but obviously for those patients who do not not respond, then it is um, important to consider both matched siblings and unrelated donor transplants. And I would even um, argue that considering HAPO transplants um, with the use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide will have similar results and, and very encouraging. So, um, and, and, and just again, you know, the, the guidelines change as we learn more about this disease and, and appropriate ways to treat it. But I think that this is a nice new um, tool for patients to be aware of. So in conclusion, um, survival continues to improve, especially for young patients with severe plastic anemia. And I think that the additional Trompag um, to IST therapy is really now the new standard of treatment. And again, um, encouraging results have been seen with haploidentical transplants. And I think that this um, challenges the consensus of waiting until relapse um, for, for this treatment, but I'm sure we'll see some prospective trials really evaluating um, use of haploidentical versus immunosuppressive therapy directly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kenval, for this nice overview over where we currently stand with aplastic anemia. Uh, 